Mr. Moore, uh, in the late 20s, why were people attracted to Detroit? People were attracted to Detroit like they attracted any place else where there's money and a possibility of uh, better living conditions or better ways of supporting their families. The, the blacks were attracted to Detroit for many reasons. Well, I won't say many, but for one particular reason. At that time, the exodus was taking place from the South, if you remember. And this was right after World War I. A lot of black servicemen had returned to the South, even though they'd been fight for democracy and all of that, and they didn't find it. And uh, with the uh, Industrial Revolution beginning right after the World War I, uh, and the uh, opening of jobs in the industrial areas, especially here in the city of Detroit, blacks and a lot of Southern whites were alerted to Detroit because of the possibility of getting jobs, number one, and uh, getting uh, better conditions to live for number two. What did your father say to you? What did he say to me? Yeah, you, your father was interested in coming to Detroit. What did he say to you? Well, you got to go back a little bit in my family. I was originally born in South Carolina. Uh, my father was a fireman on a train in South Carolina. Uh, they would, a white man would not fire a train in the South at that time. That was d below his dignity to be a fireman on a train. Uh, the white persons in the engine would only be there as an engineer to run the train. Uh, I had an uncle living in Columbus, Ohio, and my uncle had told my father about how much money he could make by coming to Columbus, Ohio. Instead of finding a train, they could probably get a job in Columbus, Ohio, find a train. Lo and behold, when he got in Ohio, they wouldn't hire blacks to find a train in Columbus. It was vice versa from what it was in the South. That was two, that was a job that no black could have. And after we settled in Ohio for some time, about five years, uh, my daddy had been working as a construction worker, and he and my mother came over to Ohio, over to Detroit one weekend to see a cousin of his on a, what you call, excursion. They would run excursion trains from Columbus, Ohio, Detroit. And most people were coming to get some Canadian whiskey, liquor, you know. At that time, they were talking about, well, go to the Motor City and you can get a whiskey from Canada. My mom and daddy, neither one of them drank it. But anyway, I had a, he had a cousin working here. And, uh, Somehow he convinced my father that he could make more money here in Detroit than he could in uh, Columbus. And my father, back and forth on the weekends, he and my mother would come over. So finally he decided to come over and give it a trial run. And uh, that trial run resulted about three or four months later in my mother and father moving to Detroit. That's what brought me to Detroit, Michigan. How did he tell you the noise? I mean, the news? This. How did he tell you that? Uh... Well, we were all going to school. You've got to remember, I came from a large family with seven boys and two girls. And uh, he would write letters back home, and then finally he came home on the weekend. He got us all together, and he told us we think he and my mother had decided to move to Detroit because of the money involved, and we could get uh, better, uh, he could get better pay. And all of us could be going to school here in the city of Detroit, which would make it better. And how much money his cousin was making over here. Uh, I didn't want to come. In fact, when my older brother, I, out of the seven boys, I'm between the first three and the last three. Two girls were older than all of us. Uh, none of us seemed to want to come at the time, but my uncle had a lot of kids our age. But uh, we finally decided, and he broke it to us, that I know this is uh, upsetting again, but I think it would be better if all of us stay together. Let's go to Detroit. There I can get a job paying much more money. Uh, you can go to school there. There's possibilities after you get out of school. You can get a job with General Motors, Ford, Chrysler, and uh, that's why the bulk of the black people are. Well, the word was Negro people at that time, or colored people. Uh, there was some hesitancy on the part of 
my older brother, the two older brothers, uh, come. Uh, but anyway, we came, and uh, my father did get a get a job, and uh, he was making five bucks a day. That was some big money. And I ran away three times going back to Ohio. I didn't like Detroit. Last time I ran away, I had six cents in my pocket over in uh, uh, Toledo, Ohio, going back to Columbus, Ohio on November 11th. And my daddy, state police called him, told him, come over and get this guy. My daddy told me, it's the third time you ran away. I'm taking you back to Detroit, and if you do it again, blah, blah, blah. And I heeded my daddy's advice and stayed here. And uh, that was the beginning of my full-time residency here in the city of Detroit. Now, in 1929, something happened here. Um, what happened to Detroit in 1929? Well, to know what happened in Detroit in 1929, you would have to live here in 1929 to see what happened. In fact, all hell broke loose. The bottom dropped out. Uh, that was the beginning of the Depression. Well, people call it the Great Depression. Banks closed. There were run on banks. Uh, people who had had uh, some savings uh, began to uh, go to banks and got put money they had out. People who were living, uh, we call it that time, high on the hog, uh, middle class and the upper class, uh, they began to uh, be the first ones to get to the banks. And as a result of that, uh, the Depression set in. The factories began to lay off. Uh, people became unemployed. And you had a lot of suicides here in Detroit, people committing suicides because they'd lost their money. And uh, from 1929 on, it got worse. It didn't get any better. It got worse. And the, some of the trials and tribulations that people had to go through during that depression, uh, sometimes I, 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 I even be a little reluctant to talk about it because being an eyewitness to it and to survive it and still be around bring back some hell of a bitter recollections and memories. Um, if you walked down the street in Detroit in 1930, what would you see? If you would walk down the streets in Detroit in 1930, you would see people standing on street corners. You would see people, few people having apples on the corner selling them. You would see people discussing uh, what should be done. You would hear people saying the leadership in Washington wasn't worth a damn. You would hear people say, where in the hell is the chicken in every pot and the garage, uh, two cars in every garage? And you would hear them discussing, uh, let's form our own party. Uh, the Republicans or Democrats aren't worth a damn. Uh, you would hear, uh, you would go uh, see people on street corners holding meetings or in a lot holding meetings. Uh, each and every group who uh, that leader was speaking to, that leader had his own opinion about how to survive or what the country was not doing and what it was doing. Uh, you saw people hungry. You saw young men and women, parents who could no longer afford to, afford to uh, send them to school. You saw people uh, going up in alleys, looking in garbage cans to find what, you could, uh, what was eatable. Uh, you saw people being evicted from their home because of uh, non-payment of rent or because non-payment of mortgages or uh, paying on their home if they were buying it. Uh, you uh, saw people uh, uh, discussing ways and means of, uh, at that time, say, it's worth a less march on Washington. You saw veterans who had been in World War I 
uh, going to the uh, veteran post, the American Legion post, and uh, saying that uh, they had been betrayed. Uh, you saw church people uh, asking you to come to church and pray to God for salvation and relieve this uh, way of living, or the uh, plague that had been brought on them. Uh, then you saw people saying that uh, we are not going to take this anymore as the depression went on. Then you begin to see formations of uh, different organizations. You had the hate groups, you had the togetherness groups, you had the veterans groups, you had the uh, beginning of the formation of the uh, unemployment councils, you had Let me put a question to you, though, uh, first, before you go on. Um, there's Detroit in the 1928. Then there's Detroit in 1930, 31. What's the difference? Detroit in 1928 and Detroit in 1930 and 31 was a hell of a lot of different. People were working in 1928. And in 1929, that's when it hit. In 1930, from 1929 on, uh, that's when uh, the Depression hit, and uh, it was downhill. 1928, uh, everybody was working. Uh, people were living door to door each other. And, uh, there was a lot of social gatherings going on. The uh, parks were filled every Sunday and Saturday afternoon. Uh, you had the theaters going, and uh, you had the burlesque going. You had the uh, speakeasies going. You know what a speakeasy is? Well, you heard of them, no doubt. You know that was before prohibition, if you remember. And uh, you could go to one of these joints and knock on the door, and the guy would look out, and if you're all right, you come in, and you can buy yourself some beer or some alcohol beverages. And you had the big bands, you had the dance halls. You, uh, uh, Detroit was a hell of a town. It was real good. It was uh, the different nationalities was living close together, there was no uh, outbursts of racism. See, everybody seemed to was uh, congealed to a certain extent that uh, it was one of these things that you could consider to a certain extent, you're, we are brother's keeper, you know. Uh, but then 1929, when the Depression hit from then on, it was a different Detroit altogether to, uh, from a standpoint of uh, unemployment and the attitude of the people. Um, when I say Detroit, different altogether from the standpoint of living conditions, unemployment. Um, how important was Henry Ford in Detroit? Henry Ford was important to Detroit uh, uh, in many ways. I, I, a lot of people who lived in Detroit worked for Henry Ford. Uh, to, to a certain extent, that was pretty good because of the income. Uh, Henry Ford was also a detriment to the city of Detroit because of the uh, conditions in the shop and the way that you had to uh, almost give up your manhood to get a job there. The other one, uh, about the different type of people he employed as the overseers of the Ford plant. Uh, goons who he had hired to prevent unions from coming in, ex-cons he had on as service people. He would get their parole from the different prisons here in uh, Michigan, and he would hire for the sole uh, objective of preventing unions and, quote, to keep order in the plant. Uh, he was an individual that uh, I would say, in certain ways, contributed a lot to the economy. Uh, but in contributing to the economy, he took that back by uh, doing, as I said before, preventing unions, uh, had a financial stranglehold on the city of Detroit and, to a certain extent, the city of Devon and some of the outlying communities. Because if you've got to remember, Henry Ford was the first one to 
off of five bucks a day. And that was a hell of a lot of money at that time. And when that was announced, you had people coming from everywhere to work for Ford Motor Company. The difference is, you, the question you ask, the, the bottom line is from uh, 1928 to 1930 and on, from 1930 on till, 19, till the war began, was that uh, financially, from 1928 to 1930, uh, Henry Ford was, uh, I would say, a key figure in the economy of the city of Detroit. At one point, you said in your in your um, uh, tape interview that he he was the kingpin. He um, wa he ran Durban, and he wanted to run Detroit. That's right. He he uh, ran Denver. Everybody who practically well not everybody uh, he had a lock hole, a financial lock hole on Durban, and he dictated the policies of what the city of Durban should do and when they do it and how they do it. And uh, he had laws passed where you couldn't pass out any literature on the streets of Durban. Uh He uh, financially, uh, by paid taxes to the city of Durban, uh he controlled it. What did he want from Detroit? All Henry Ford wanted from Detroit was a hell of a manpower to work in his plant. And uh, he would like to have also controlled Detroit politically. But uh, to a certain extent, that did happen. Most certainly, he had people in high places in Detroit, he elected people in high places in Detroit who catered to Henry Ford, who bowed to his wishes. But in the main, I think uh, most of the politicians were, to a certain extent, independent and far beyond. Well, the, what the politicians in the city of Devon were to Henry Ford. Um, how did your family get by? Well, he got by just like any other family had to get by. Uh, we would, as you remember, back at that time, they didn't have gas furnaces. You burn coal to keep your house warm in the wintertime. Uh, all of us would go out during the winter to shovel snow off sidewalks, uh, to haul ashes out of the basement of people, 15 cents. 15 cents was a hell of a lot of money. Shovel a whole sidewalk and carry out all the ashes out of a basement and dump them in the alley. Uh, we would uh, go to the market to help the farmers unload their food. Uh, we would uh, jump on a train to keep warm in the wintertime, a freight train that was loaded with coal going down the railroad over here on the east side. And we would throw off coal to take home and challenge the railroad detectives. Not only my family did it, all families did it. Black and white families. And that's what I think is missing today. The black and white families at that time was, uh, they, they was under the same roof. Nobody could claim I'm better than you because of my income, because everybody was getting kicked in the rear because of the Depression at the time. And they had to acknowledge that. Their own appearance showed it. Uh, <laughs> their living condition showed it. Their homes showed it. And uh, you got to remember, there were seven Husky boys in my family, and just only two girls. And uh, it was hard. I left home along with my brothers uh, sometime when we would, my mama would cook dinner just to make it possible for my younger brothers, my sisters, my mom and daddy to eat. I wouldn't eat. My other brother would do the same. I was hungry as hell. But uh, my mother and my dad were like, they said, come back, sit at the table, come on and eat. I said, well, no, I'm going down to Brewster Center, down to the gym and work out. We played basketball. Uh, you know, Wintertime, played baseball on the playground in the summertime, but hungry as hell. But what we would do, uh, the Eastern Market wasn't too far, it's not too far from here. They say all the apples that, that uh, had been injured that the farmers would discard, try to sell them, well, we'd take them, take that rotten part off and eat the good part, bring it home and peel it and have your mother make some apple jelly or 
make some fruit out of it and boil it or fry it or whatever with potatoes the same way. Now you got to remember we still had Gross Point. Gross Point is the was and still is the uh, financial uh, up tight and uh, upper crust part of the city of Detroit. You had millionaires living there, but they also had their trials and tribulation because the income that they'd been uh, accustomed to was not as great as it had been, but they were still living 100,000% better than we were, you know, but they needed our services. Uh, the services included, again, I repeat that, cutting their lawns in the summer, having your mother, your sister doing domestic work for them, or your father chauffeuring for them. My mother never did do any domestic work. My father never did do any chauffeuring. Uh, and I think that was because my mother had a large family. And we were proud that we were able to have her stay home with, uh, with us, and we would do the work, whatever we could get. And you got to remember, the cost of living was so far down, it wasn't high like it is. You could get a uh, quart of milk for four cents. You could get a dozen eggs for three cents. You could get a slab of bacon like that for 35 cents, a slab of bacon. But where in the hell was you going to get the four cents? Where was you going to get the 35 cents? That was the big question. You, know? you could get a steak dinner for 40 cents. You could get a rib steak, mashed potatoes and gravy, cup of coffee, apple pie, and ice cream on it for 40 cents. That was a big deal. Uh, you ask how we got by, that was how we got by, by doing just, whatever we just could. Just right out there, just after you described it, 40 cents. Oh, that was great. How about the time? <laughs> That's the end of camera roll 36. That was the great. End of sound roll 22. Mr. Moore, could you describe, uh, where were you standing when you saw this, this uh, March 30th, I mean, March 1930? Uh -huh. Do you remember where you were standing when you saw that? I was standing in front of the old Roxy Theater on Woodward Avenue. I'm sorry, could you start again? I, I stepped in your word. Uh, I was standing in front of the old Roxy Theater on Woodward Avenue. And uh, the parade itself was, uh, again, an indication of the satisfaction of the people with the uh, situation they had to live under. And I think it was not only dissatisfaction, but it inspired many people to move on, or try to move on, to see what else could be gained by being together. Uh, of course, at that time, uh, as I say, Detroit was uh, a city of despair, uh, a city of uh, uncertainty, uh, a city of uh, many ethnic groups, uh, a city who seemed the promises that uh, seemed to have existed before had completely gone. And the question is, where the hell do we go from here? The question was at that time, where do we go from here? Thanks, that's great. Um, can you describe, you were involved in your first action was uh, involved involved in, a, in eviction which you witnessed can you tell me about that eviction be as vivid as you can well as you know uh, as I indicated before that uh, so many people were unemployed they had no kind of financial income at all they didn't have any finances for food they didn't have any finances for clothes they didn't have any finances for medical care they didn't have any financial aid for any kind of <coughs> support at all. And uh, especially those people who were renters at the time. And the landlords, they were suffering also. The, the homeowners who, uh, the uh, property owners, I put it, who owned these homes that were being rented to people, uh, they were being pushed to pay taxes. They didn't have a damn thing to pay taxes with. In turn, they pushed the people who were, they were renting these places to to pay the rent. 
And in turn, those people couldn't pay the rent because they didn't have any money coming in to pay the rent. So what would happen, uh, they would go to the courts and get eviction notices, uh, uh, permits rather, to evict these people. And uh, uh, the evictions was uh, something real bad to see. January, when you see families being set out in snow, three and four and five inches of snow, and uh, with the uh, mother holding maybe a two-month-old baby, a three-month-old baby, and the others cluttered around her and her husband. And it was hard as hell for people to take. And this went on for some time. And out of that came some resistance. And the resistance came from a lot of people in the neighborhood. When uh, I remember the first one I saw, I didn't know what the hell it was all about, but. Uh, we were behind on our rent, five months behind at the time. And they had evicted a family and they blocked it up where I lived. And so uh, one of the guys said, well, let's send them back in. They wanted to beat the hell out of the uh, process service at the time, but they said, look, I'm getting uh, 75 cents to do this. That's what they were paying these guys, 75 cents, to go out to evict you. And I don't give a damn what you do after I leave, but and that's what we decided to do. After he, they would leave, we'd go put the people back in. And that, that, that began to spread, not only in our block, all over the east side. And uh, the police at that time was paying the police officer $23 a week in uh, script. They weren't getting paid in American money. The policemen were being paid in script. So they had a hell of a hard way to go. So we decided that every time they said anybody out in our neighborhood, we was going to put them back in the house. That's what we did. And that's how I got involved with the unemployment councils. Uh, most of the people who were doing this were men or young men whose, mother, whose fathers belonged to it, or mother and father belonged to the unemployment council or uh, some of the leaders of the unemployment council, but mostly it was just neighbor supporting a neighbor. If your family was being evicted, we'd say, what the hell are you doing here? Uh, we, we would challenge those people who was in it, but again, I repeat that they, they had a uh, work to do, and they were victims themselves. Some of those who were sitting out people had got notices themselves. So uh, it grew and grew and grew. To, we had a situation here in Detroit that as fast as they would evict people, we would put them back in. And the police, uh, as, as, as uh, what they were, uh, they would turn their heads sometime and go the other way. They wouldn't try to put you back in. So what would happen, you would be uh, what they call a uh, challenge in the order of the court. Uh, you would be in violation of a court order. But the same judge who gave that eviction notice, he himself had to get elected by these people here in the city of Detroit when election time came. And he was a little hesitant to send you to jail, you know, and because he wanted to make that little buck what he was making to retain that job. But all in all, I, I would say the, the, the evictions that took place on the east side of Detroit was one that if you could have some documentation of movies could have been made of it, it would have been worth a million dollars today to see some of the young men and women. You had young men and women who formed brigades to help go back and set people back in their homes. And that's how people stayed. So finally what happened to people who owned the homes, they couldn't keep up the mortgages on it, so they lost them because they couldn't pay the mortgages, the owners couldn't, the people who were renting couldn't pay the rent. Uh, the, uh, uh, the city who was expecting money from the owner to pay taxes on that home wasn't getting any money. And the uh, policeman who was supposed to be enforcing the law uh, that had been ordered by the judge to not to let these people, he was reluctant to do it because he himself was facing eviction. What the hell could he do with $23 a week in script, not in American money now? He had to take that money to a grocery store that script to a grocery store to buy groceries or, or buy him a pair of shoes or buy his wife a dress or his kids something to eat. So that was the beginning of 
possibility, a hell of a revolution, not you know, in the city of Detroit, but all over this country. And I don't think it was just confined to Detroit, but Detroit was one hell of a place at that time. Murphy was a good guy, wasn't he? Yeah. Murphy was a good guy because you have to to know why Frank Murphy was a good guy. He himself had seen his people persecuted in Ireland. Frank Murphy saw the British Army drag some of his relatives behind a horse when. he was in Ireland growing up. And I think that had a bearing on Mayor Murphy uh, for many, many years, in fact, up until he died. And uh, once uh, he was elected mayor of the city of Detroit, uh, in his own way, I think he tried to send a message to the people of the city of Detroit about how he felt personally about the plight, the hardships, and all of the things that uh, they had to live under, uh, and the the families, the uh, uh, non-financial conditions they had. Uh, And definitely, he was a good governor. You know, he went on to be governor of the state of Michigan. I don't know whether you wanted me to jump from mayor no, to governor now, right. okay? And uh, while he was mayor of the city of Detroit, uh, I think the, uh, the people began to see in Murphy uh, some of the things that they would like to have seen happen if he could uh, do some things for them. But the city of Detroit was broke didn't have any money, just like any other city around, you know. And what low federal help was coming in uh, was not enough to even make a debt uh, for the unemployed people and the people who were living here in Detroit. You didn't have any federal programs like you have now. You didn't have any kind of uh, uh, medical care. You didn't have any uh, uh, support for pregnant mothers. You did not have any Uh, Social Security. You didn't have any Medicare. You didn't have any uh, social service agencies who's going to give you some help. And what had the welfare department, they themselves went broke. The city didn't have any money to finance the department anymore. So Detroit, uh, as I said, they had to resort to script. They didn't have any more money. And the only money they had was left in Detroit was uh, what a few banks stayed open and what money the uh, big shots had out in Gross Point. And it was one of those cases then where uh, a few had all, all of it, and the many didn't have a damn thing. And Could you tell me how you got involved in the unemployment councils and what they were like? Well, yeah, as I indicated before, I got involved in when I got involved with these evictions. And uh, the un- unemployment council was just what the words say, unemployed, you know, because uh, so many people had been affected uh, by the plant's closings and the depression that they were unemployed. And uh, they were, the unemployment council was saying that this was needless. Why can't we be working? We're willing to work. We can make some money, we can spend some money. But it went beyond just unemployment, you know, discussions at the council. They got into the political part of it, the individuals uh, who was holding public office come under either praise or attack. And uh, finally, it was uh, one of these, uh, got to a point uh, where less, all of the, Unemployment councils get together and merge from all parts of the city. And uh, somewhere down the road, let's put on one hell of a display 
Let's march on Ford. Let's march on General Motors. Let's march on Chrysler. Let's march on Thompson Products. Let's show our strength by the togetherness by letting them know that we have had it and we're going to show them that together we're going to get something. You know. Uh, then you had all kinds of different individuals who was espousing their uh, thoughts about it. They, some were Marxists, some were socialists, some were Democrats, some were dissatisfied Republicans, those uh, some were just individuals. Uh, some were veterans from World War I, you know. And, uh, but they all were, all of them had an objective. And that objective was uh, uh, why and what can we do to eliminate this situation that we all are confronted with. And uh, the answer to that was, in my opinion, was when he decided that he was going to put on this march. And it, uh, a lot of people's amazement, they did not think it would be involving the number of people that were involved. You had people who wasn't uh, involved with the unemployment councils who took part in the, in the march. But I, uh, to their credit, uh, by block, by block, and by uh, neighborhood by neighborhood, uh, the unemployment council was so affected that practically everybody knew each other. And, they, uh, and by this uh, knowing each other, and you say the Janinis knew the Joneses, the Washington knew the Stokowskis, the Stokowskis knew the Altmans, uh, the Altmans knew the uh, Gonzales. The Gonzales uh, knew the, uh, it was on and on, a mixture of ethnics and different nationalities, different religions, uh, uh, different colors, uh, different neighborhoods, all of them confronted with the same thing. And uh, to this day, I give the unemployment councils much credit for bringing to the attention and galvanizing and uh, organizing uh, the people in the city of Detroit to have some kind of way of expressing themselves and reach and try to reach some goal to bring to the attention of uh, the powers that be at that time in Washington, D.C., that this was a warning. This is a day that you're going to remember. We're going to have a day that you're going to remember. Uh, whether it's today or whether it's tomorrow, you're going to recognize or you're going to understand or you're going to see some things that you don't believe that we will be willing to do to make this a better place to live. And that took place. Can you describe how that came about? What did you see? I saw it uh, leading up. I don't know whether you want me to go into this or not to... Uh, the, well, maybe you could talk about Grand Circus Park and what, how you saw it building up. Yeah, well, as I, I, some time ago I told you, from you had all kind of individuals who were good speakers. And I don't think they were good just because they had uh, went to school to take public speaking. I think they were damn good because the conditions they had to live under. They were giving their own opinions about how their family suffered. And they didn't have to give it because everybody knew it anyway. And when you take a group of people, I don't give a damn who they are, who have been subjected to uh, unemployment, no income, and seeing their families suffer over a period of time, uh, the string is going to snap somewhere. And uh, the meetings they used to have at Grand Circus Park, the meetings they had at the different neighborhoods, Polish neighborhood, all of them began to get together, and when that happened, uh, one meeting at well, my group of the unemployment council on Erskine and Hastings Street here in the city of Detroit, uh, a resolution was put forward by a guy named Nelson Davis that we ask all the unemployment councils to join uh, in a mass demonstration 
Well, nobody thought it would have the effect if it did, but I don't think it was the resolution itself that did it. I think it was just the attitude and the minds of the people. And out of that came uh, an agreement all over the city that they would have a march. And this march would be on Ford Motor Company for jobs. And it took place, 1932. But the history of that march and the people who suffered, the people who died, the people who were injured, the people who were put in jail, uh, drew the attention not only nationwide, but I think worldwide. Because if you remember, there were five or six people who got killed in that march. Not because they did anything wrong, not because they had destroyed anything, not because they had uh, fought anyone, but uh, because the Ford Motor Company saw fit to stop it by bullets and clubs, and that's what they tried to do. Uh, I don't know whether you ever saw any pictures of that march in, on, on Mellow Road and what took place on that day, but the outcome of that march, I, I, all kind of estimates were given, 75,000, 100,000, 120,000, I don't know how many it was, but I know there were many. Uh, Every nationality, every uh, political line of thinking, uh, every religious line of thinking were put aside. There was no division on I'm black, I'm white, I'm Protestant, I'm Catholic. Uh, the objective was to demonstrate before the Ford Motor Company that uh, the conditions that the people of the city of Detroit and the suburbs, you had people from Melvin Dale, you had people from uh, Lincoln Park, you had people from Highland Park, you had people from Hamtramck, these are all suburbs of the city of Detroit, I don't know whether you know about them, converged on the Ford Motor Company. March all the way from Detroit to Devon, across Devon Line into the city of Devon and onto the plant there on Miller Road. But uh, the brutality that the Ford Motor Company uh, resorted to uh, was something that uh, will always remember, will always uh, be well, in my mind, you know. Could, can I stop you there for a second? Um, um, do you remember? You, you talked about Ford's service department. Who ran the service department? What kind of power did they have? There was a guy named Harry Bennett. He had unquestioned power. He had uh, unchallenged power. And he had uh, power far beyond the imagination of many people. And that power had been given to him by Henry Ford himself. And uh, it was a brutal system that they had. Uh, and the answer to any uh, resentment or any kind of challenge to the Ford Motor Company, why, why you, you paid with your life in some instances. Or uh, you got the hell beat out you physically in some instances. And that uh, was a, a, a real, uh, when you ask who, who gave, who, how did he have the power, who had the power, well, the power was bestowed to him by Henry Ford himself. Harry Bennett ran the service department for the Ford Motor Company. He was a ruthless, a damn no good son of a bitch. He's dead and gone, and I don't know whether he went to heaven or hell, but if he's down there in the furnace room, I hope he's burned. Okay, that's great. Um, is, how, what do we got left? Uh, 18 feet is gonna be dirty. Depression shoot 627.90. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Mr. Moore, can you describe that march, March 7th, 1932? Well, the march itself uh, started in many communities, but primarily was in the city of Detroit. Uh, Ferry and Rivard Street, where most you had up there were people from uh, the Ukraine. You had uh, 
Czechs, you had Romanians, you had uh, uh, many people from the Baltic states. Further down in the city, you had the black neighborhood, Hastings Street, uh, St. Antoine Street, Rivard Street. Then, uh, then you had the Jewish community, then you had the uh, Italian community, and uh, actually the, 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 the uh, march started here in the city of Detroit. But all, and as they began to move out of Detroit into the, going through the other areas of uh, the uh, suburbs, like Dearborn, then you had people from what you call the Down River, Inkster, Ecos, River Rouge, Dearborn, Lincoln Park, Allen Park, Highland Park, Hamtramck, all joined in. Uh, we had no trouble till we got to the city limits of Detroit going into Devon itself, a little place called Baby Creek Park. And there, all of us assembling going to, uh, from different parts, and we're going to march up to Mellow Road. And when we got to Mellow Road and Dix, that's when we were challenged by the uh, service department in the city of Devon Police Department. And they told us we couldn't go any further. Uh, a quick meeting was held, and, uh, but you got to understand there were thousands and thousands of people. I don't know how many there were. Some of the newspapers gave all kind of versions of it. 75,000, 100,000, 125,000, 150, all in all. But there were people who had never seen each other before from all of these communities and from the city of Detroit who had joined in the march. And we were challenged at the Mellow Road and Dix Avenue by the service department and the Devon Police Department. A quick meeting was held, and uh, it was decided that we would march on. Uh, as the march began, uh, the Ford Motor Company people opened up with uh, water hoses and uh, that didn't stop. So uh, another two or three hundred yards, that's when the gunfire started. And naturally, with uh, thousands of people being involved and with the police, uh, with the Ford Motor Company people shooting, and the police, Devon Police Department, wheeling the clubs and blackjacks and whatnot. Naturally, people began to retreat like any human being would with gunfire. We didn't have anything. Best thing we had probably was a match and a cigarette. But as the people began to fall, you could see uh, blood. You could see one woman holding a young man in her arms and dying. Uh, you could see police grabbing men and women. Uh, holding them, beating them, and uh, all in all, it was one hell of a brutal uh, display of uh, terror by the people in the Ford Motor Company's uh, service department and the city of Devon Police Department. But uh, the outcome of that was, not only in my opinion, many of us have expected since then, uh, the uh, unnecessary brutality that they displayed on that day. With the approval of the third largest corporate giant in the world, and that is the Ford Motor Company at that time. And I say with the approval because damn sure they were representatives and no doubt had the orders from the top management of Ford Motor Company to do, to do exactly what they did, and that was murder, number one. That was brutality, number two. And that was insensitivity to any people, number three, and on and on. Uh, but those uh, people who died on Miller Road that day uh, died for a cause. They died because they wanted to see a better country. They died because they knew that in this country where we lived, uh, they should not, and their family should not, 
have to suffer like they were doing I was, uh, was at the time. And they, they died because they uh, was firmly convinced that somewhere something was wrong. And that day, I, I grew up to be a man at that, on that time when I saw uh, the blood that was on Miller Road, when I saw those people being shot down. And uh, that day, I decided that uh, from then on, whatever it takes, I was going to do whatever I could to correct the situation. Well, I did it. And some people say, not only me, others as well. Some call me a radical. Some call me a communist. Some call me a, a, a no good so and so and so. But people who get, uh, brand people with these kind of names, what not, uh, people who didn't have to live under these conditions, people who didn't see this brutality take place, people who didn't see women being clubbed like animals, people who didn't see uh, young men in the bloom of their life, 18, 19, and 20, 21 years old, being murdered, openly murdered, without, there was no resistance, you know, just said, we go to march. And to this day, the blood of those people on, uh, on the hands of the Ford Motor Company, uh, and, uh, and, and the blood that flowed that day between the black and whites on Miller Road uh, brought together a togetherness that still exists in the Ford Motor Company among the workers of the Ford to this day. Many who took part in that march have passed on, but they have uh, sons, they have grandsons or daughters or granddaughters. Some of them are still working at the Ford Motor Company today. Uh, those who paid with what the last thing they had in that is life itself, I don't think uh, the payment was in vain because it paved the way uh, later on uh, for the union to get in Fords. And the blood that flowed that day on Miller Road uh, between the black and the white people uh, was of uh, uh, blood that banded together uh, the black and white people uh, of the city of Detroit and some of the suburbs, and especially those who had been employed by the Ford Motor Company were laid off, and especially those who later became employees of the Ford Motor Company. And it made possible a friendship among the Can you tell me, um, can you tell me the, about your friend, seeing your friend, what effect well, Joe York was uh, a friend. I'm sorry, sir, uh, you said that right now, sir. Uh, but let, let me go back a little further before I tell you, but uh, and that day what happened that day you paved the way f later on for the Union to get in force. Because uh, if it had not been for that march and the people who participated in the march and the people who survived the march, I do not think the Ford Motor Company would have been organized by the Union as quickly uh, as it was. Because if you remember, Ford was the last one of the big three to be organized. General Motors was organized first, Chrysler was second, and Ford, we organized General Motors back in 1937. Uh, uh, and it took us all the way from 1937 to 1941 to organize Ford. Chrysler came back. But the people who, who survived that march and the uh, participation uh, that they engaged in later on to help bring the union into, Ford, uh, into, into the Ford plant uh, made it possible for a lot of other people to be where they are today. And it was the blood that flowed between the black and white on Miller Road that day set up a bond of friendship between the blacks and the white in the Ford plant that still exists today to some extent. Because part of organizing Ford Motor Company, the Rouge plant, there also came organization of Local 600. And you still see 
and Local 600, the brotherhood, the tranquility, the friendship, and the togetherness of whites and blacks that you'd never see in a place throughout the whole UAW in this country. You'll never see that kind. For Ford Local 600, through its black and white membership, uh, pioneered many progressive things. Some questions about what? Well, I'm, I'm going to ask you this completely all wrong. Um, were Henry Ford and Herbert Hoover linked in your mind? Well, you got to understand, uh, at that time, uh, Herbert Hoover was a president that had no consideration for the people at all. He had no consideration for the people at all because he didn't do anything uh, to try to make it possible that some people, the people in the country could get some. Sorry, I think we better, I think you're, you're, are you I may be sweating now. I don't know. Okay. Um, so Ford and, and Herbert Hoover were great friends. Right? Uh -huh. Did they share the same philosophies in your mind? Or? In my opinion, they did because uh, I indicated before Hoover didn't seem to give a damn about the plight of the people. And Henry Ford didn't seem to give a damn about the plight of the people, only when he did, it was to his advantage, not to the people's advantage. And uh, the uh, relationship between Ford and Hoover at the time uh, was uh, such that uh, during the time that Hoover was president, that uh, they had much in common. They had much in common from a standpoint that uh, they uh, Hoover did not do anything to have Ford Motor Company uh, as president uh, of the United States to uh, say, well, we're going to, if, if you're going to lay off people like this, the federal government will try to do something to help you. What can we do? And Ford didn't ask for a damn thing. And I don't think uh, it was necessary for him to ask for anything because of the relationship he had with uh, President uh, Hoover at the time. Now, I don't know, I can't give you any uh, authentic answer about what knowledge I have that they were close friends. I don't know. Uh, I can only go by what I witnessed at the time and the experiences I had to go through at the time when both of them were at the height of their power. Uh, he being the president, Ford being the owner of Ford Motor Company. Uh, he didn't do anything from a federal level to help the unions get into Ford. He didn't do anything from a federal level to protect the workers uh, of, of Ford Motor Company. He didn't do anything from a federal level to <clears throat> offer anything to the veterans who were in World War and who were employed at the Ford Motor Company at the time. In fact, uh, the veterans themselves, as you mentioned a little while ago, they had to uh, demonstrate themselves by going to Washington. And you know what happened now. MacArthur just ruthlessly beat the hell out of them. And many of those veterans who went to Washington were also former employees of the Ford Motor Company. Uh, and answer to your question, in my own thinking, yeah, I think there were close uh, friends of understanding uh, to preserve the status quo and to uh, not do anything that they thought would help better the situation. I, I don't have any proof on my own that uh, of this, but action speaks louder than words. Okay, I'm going to go back to the the other thing. What was the press reaction to the to the events of that march to the to the mass? I know probably you've seen some of the headlines of the Detroit Times at that time. The Detroit Times was owned solely hook, line, and second by a guy named Randolph Hearst. 
And Randolph Hearst had never been friends of the working people. But they had to question uh, whether it was necessary that the brutality had been waged by the service people of Ford Motor Company and the Devon Police Department. Was it necessary they had to resort to this kind of brutality or to the uh, people who was in the march? Uh, and uh, then uh, the Ford made the uh, accusation, uh, some of them made the accusation that all of these people were communist. Can you say start that again, Ford made? made some accusation oh, so that... You started by saying uh, Henry Ford, or, because we need to identify him. Well, Henry Ford had said the communists had tried to take over his plant. And the newspapers played that up to a certain extent. But both, there were three newspapers here in the time, at, at that time, there were Detroit Times, the Free Press, and the News. Uh, two of them are still in existence now, as the News and the Free Press, the Times closed some years ago. But the press, you asked, the question you asked was, the, what was the reaction of the press? The press reaction was mixed. Whether these people were trying to take over the Ford Motor Company plant, or whether they were just ordinary working people who were seeking some answer to the unemployment problem. As I indicated, the Times said that they questioned whether it was necessary for the Ford Motor Company to resort to the measures that they did in taking away the lives of these people. Uh, but the press being what they were at that time, naturally, we didn't get any, I don't think we got any favorable publicity other than that one statement made by the Detroit Times at the, uh, at the, at the particular time that questioned me whether it was necessary for this kind of action to be taken and uh, uh, whether the uh, government was going to interfere. Uh, the press being the press like they are, they're no different, in my opinion, what they are now. Uh, they will always side uh, with the powers that be. The press will always try to stick to the status quo. Uh, you may find some individuals who write for the press may take a little different line once in a while, and like what was at that time. Uh, but in the main, the press didn't do anything to help the cause, other than mention about was it necessary to resort to this kind of uh, action. Okay, can I ask you, uh, they played the International the day of the funeral. Do you remember that? They did what? They played the International. Yeah, yeah. They played the International at the funeral. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I never have said, even up to this day, that there wasn't some communist there. Uh, and I, I never, when I won't back off of that because uh, some people who admitted they were communists gave leadership. They were, they helped organize the march. They was uh, involved in the uh, unemployment councils. And uh, there were other people who were not communists who gave leadership and who was involved in the, in the uh, unemployment council. There were many people in that march who uh, didn't even know how to spell the word communist at that time. Uh, there were individuals in that march who uh, were preachers. There were in church people in that march. There were workers in that march. There were women in that march. There were men in that march. There were kids in that march. And if they played the international, which they did. What the hell that had to do with it, you know, if they played the international? Uh, if uh, they played the international from a standpoint that this was uh, something of togetherness, that all people uh, who were being oppressed, all people who were uh, pushed aside, all people who were denied, all people who uh, were seeking a better way of life, uh, I, what's the difference in playing the international? Because at that time, uh, I think most of the people didn't have any faith in playing the national anthem. The national anthem had been played over and over again, but it's still in, uh, the conditions still existed. And I don't say just because the uh, international was played, it was going to better their con uh, condition. 
but you got to also remember that the national anthem was played also. There's a lot of people don't mention that. They want to make hay out of the fact that, well, it, the international was played, and this must have been sponsored up in a part of a world revolution that was advocated by Russia. That came into play. All of that was said. But out of those thousands of people there, if all of them had been communist, I'm damn sure it would have been a different situation than what it was. And they, nobody can tell me that all of those people who took part in that march were all communists. I'm going to say yes, yeah, some were, and they openly admitted that they were. Some were not, and some were opposed to the communists in that march. Opposed to them because of, uh, number one, because of the, uh, 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 the uh, political aspect, but not from the objective itself. And they would express themselves that way. But uh, to try to make hay of this because the international was played as a justification to protect the Ford Motor Company, those people don't know what the hell it was all about. Who would, who would, those people who would make that kind of statement, if indeed that was the cause of them making a the statement, to say that the international, in as much as the international was played, that all of these people were communists. No, I don't buy that. Please tell me what you saw um, during the massacre when Joe got killed. During the massacre? When, during the fourth march on day three, when Joe got killed. Well, a few minutes after the gunfire opened up, I saw Joe turn and hold his chest and fall to the ground. And uh, I went over, another guy in there, Chris Alston, and I went over to Joe. And uh, Chris put his arm under his head. And uh, all I could remember seeing Joe's eyes blink like this and this, his head drop. And uh, it was something that uh, to see a friend of you pass out like that, uh, it, uh, it, it was real bad. Uh, people began to scream, and I saw the guys begin to fall. And I saw a black woman holding uh, Coleman Lenny in her arms. Uh, Coleman had been shot also, and he died there on Miller Road. And uh, people began to scream and holler, go away, go away. And they, oh, they got guns, they got guns. And uh, to witness people being shot down in the presence of you is not a good thing. I could see if it was in time of war, maybe, and you'd been prepared for it. I could see if it was some hostility that you know you were going into and expect some kind of a fight back from whoever you were confronting, but not expecting it. And to see people you'd been acquainted with and friends of, uh, dropping at your feet is not a good experience. And uh, it's, it's hard to talk about it, but uh, I guess sometime it's necessary to let people know what actually happened there. And I appreciate you asking me the question uh, because I feel as though that uh, even at this late date, uh, the people should know actually what happened in that march on Ford Motor Company in 1932. I don't claim to have all the answers as to what happened there. I can only speak for what I saw 
and what I experienced and what I saw and what I experienced. I hold it totally against the Ford Motor Company to this day, and I will never forgive them. And I will never forget the people who gave their lives that day to make it possible so that uh, this country or the city of Detroit would have a better way of governing the people and to be a better way for people to understand and to live together. And uh, also, never forget that to me, again, it was the opening day for the Union to come in the forward because it did later on, some years later. And to those who did die on Miller Road that day, we owe them a debt that we will never be able to pay because they gave all they had, and that is life itself, to make it possible for some of us to survive. You were a pallbearer, weren't you? Can you describe? I was an honor guard, yeah. Can you describe your funeral? Hundreds of people passed, thousands of people passed the caskets uh, at the hall upon ferry and Ravat. And uh, the funeral procession was long. Many thousands of people took place, uh, or participated in the funeral. You had expressions of sympathy coming from many, many different people. You had the press was there, and uh, the families of those who were the victims of the of the uh, Ford Motor Company's uh, attack uh, were both black and white, and uh, it brought upset that funeral was a real sad affair. Uh, the sidewalks was crowded. The many friends of those who, who even were not at the march showed up. And uh, it'll be a day of remembrance, especially those of us who are still around, that uh, make us know that uh, what those guys uh, did and uh, the things that they wanted to see happen. Some of the people are reaping the benefits of it today because if it had not been for them, I don't think this town would have been the town that it turned out to be later on because the people were prepared to not only here in Detroit to do something real drastic. I don't think that we'd have, as a country, that we'd have had the same uh, way of uh, uh, governing ourselves as we have today if it had not. I think that uh, the people, whether it would have been good or bad, I do not know, but the people were in this town, and I believe other places well, were prepared and organizing to do some things on their own because they could not continue to live under the conditions that the federal government and the corporations had imposed on them. It was a day of sadness in this town on the day of that funeral. When um, Henry Ford closed his auto plant in August of 1934, one, what kind of effect did that have on this city? Well, I mentioned before it had a hell of a financial effect on the city because a lot of people who lived in Detroit were employees of the Ford Motor Company. And when he closed the plant, uh, naturally that had an economic effect on not only the people who had been laid off, but on the city as a whole. And uh, 
it didn't improve, it got worse. Because they had no other place to go. Uh, Chrysler wasn't hiring, General Motors wasn't hiring. In fact, they began to lay off themselves. And as you got to remember, this was an auto industrial town. There was no other economy here. This whole town was built around automobiles. And if you wasn't an auto worker, you were in the plant where they made the automobile, you were working in a place where they made parts for the automobiles. And you could see the effect of what Ford did. And depending on some of the parts, glass and different places like that, tires, all of it uh, began to suffer. Uh, some of the plants who supplied the Ford Motor Company, who supplied General Motors, they had to lay off. But uh, what you had was an area of starvation. What you had was an area in a time of deprivation. What you had was an area of time of uh, non-care on the part of uh, the federal government and to a certain extent, uh, the city government, because the city government could only do so much without the help of the federal government. And as a result, it had an effect on everybody that lived in the city of Detroit. In fact, it boiled down, just a few had every damn thing, and the many didn't have anything. That's what it had. It, it, it just was uh, uh, where to survive, you had to be strong, you had to suffer, uh, you had to uh, see your family be deprived of certain things, uh, you, you had to uh, beg, or you had to plead, you had to ask, and you were denied in most cases. But, uh, Again, I repeat, it was the many, uh, the many didn't have anything, and the few had it all. The money was tied up just by a few people, not only, especially here in Detroit. It was the auto barons who had the money. The auto barons and the property owners, they had the money. And when Ford laid off, they held theirs. The auto barons held their money, and the people who were depending on them for survival and for financial income didn't have anything. And I go back again, you didn't have any federal agencies looking out for you now. Can you tell me about Joe, Joe York? Joe York was a typical young energetic man, young man, who came along uh, at the time of the Depression. I got acquainted with Joe during the unemployment councils. And uh, Joe was one of the first guys that I got acquainted with by helping people back into their homes after they were evicted. And uh, I struck up a relationship with he and uh, that lasted up until his death. In fact, uh, on the march, Joe and I, from time to time, was marching together on our way to the Ford Motor Company. And uh, he was a guy that uh, color didn't mean anything to him, and he demonstrated that in many ways. Uh, he and I and Chris Alton, another young black guy, Chris is still alive today, uh, struck up a friendship uh, where we always did some things uh, to help the people. And Joe went out his way to do things, uh, such as if uh, he had anything that uh, he thought other people could share in, he would do it. Uh, for example, Joe would be throwing coal off the freight trains over on a pier market railway, put them in a basket, and he'd come back through the neighborhood and share that coal with some of the neighbors in the neighborhood, take the rest of it home. Uh, well, I used to see him help elderly people across the street. 
And again, I emphasize this, it wasn't white people, it was black people, even though Joe was white himself. He would uh, try to do things to uh, help people who couldn't help themselves. And uh, he was a guy that always, in my opinion, that uh, wanted to see things better for people uh, and to see things uh, better for uh, those who wanted to see things better. Uh, I don't know what I can say other than to say he was, a, he was a man of the people at that time, a young man in the bloom of his life, just because life just began to bloom. And uh, he, if he had have lived, if he hadn't been murdered, I think he could have made a lot of contributions to the city of Detroit for his understanding of people. Uh, and his uh, interest in uh, uh, better living conditions for the people, and also uh, his thoughts about uh, togetherness of all people. Uh, he, not only he, but the others who uh, was murdered on that day were young men uh, that uh, most of us had the same uh, problems. There were no different problems whether you were black or whether you were white. All of us were, say, were faced with the same problems. And uh, Joe's willingness to participate and to defy the guns of the Ford Motor Company was indeed to me an act that uh, will live forever for those who saw what happened on that day. And uh, to give up his life, uh, or his life to be taken by the Ford Motor Company like it was, uh, had a bearing on many of us who survived that march. And out of that, we were determined that those who died that day, they did not die in vain. We was going to do everything we could to carry on in the tradition that Joe York, Coleman Lenny, and the Curtis Williams and the others who died did not die in vain, but we are going to do whatever we could to make it possible that their dream would live on. And I, I know it lived on because we organized the plant later on. And the conditions did change. And it changed because the people themselves made a change when they elected Roosevelt in 1932. If you remember, Roosevelt was elected in 1932. And in 1933, he enacted many. Sorry, we're, we're past our time. Um, we, I can't go into Roosevelt. That's for the next film. OK. Time to be back. This is uh, 30 seconds of room tone. Room tone? That's the